Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I can see already some participants joining. We are expecting a lot of people here today. Also for this webinar to celebrate a bit the World Water Day, that it will be in two days, in Friday. And today we have an important topic to talk about, a bit about like this skill gap between the young water professionals and also be the senior and how can we address this and trying to bridge this skills gap in the water and sanitation jobs. Welcome everybody. It's great seeing so many numbers here rising in my screen. Good afternoon for some of you, maybe good night for others. But thank you so much for joining to this IW webinar. My name is Francisco Braga and I will be the moderator today. You are already welcome to also introduce yourselves in the chat. Just say, where are you from? Uh, what you're doing in the water sector? And I guess we'll just wait maybe one more minute for the last participants to enter. And then I guess we can join this amazing and interesting webinar that we have prepared for you with interesting speakers, but also a, hopefully a great panel discussion where all of you are invited to also ask questions. That's great. We can already see some people writing in the chat. Thank you so much. So welcome everybody. My name is Francisca Braga. As I mentioned before, I'm part of the Young Water Professionals uh, Denmark, the Danish chapter, and I'm the secretary. And today I'm welcoming you here in this IWA webinar for water and sanitation jobs, bridging the skills gap. For the agenda for today, uh, we'll have some pre three presentations and then a panel discussion, around 50 minutes, this panel discussion, and then some close remarkings. So the first presentation is about actually this bridging the gap, guiding the young people's career, and then the employment trends. Just a little bit about like some house rules, let's say it, for the webinar information, this webinar is recorded and it will be made available on demand on IW Connected Plus, also with the presentation slides and other information that is important. Of course, the speakers are responsible in terms of copyright permissions and their opinions are, of course, their own opinions and doesn't necessarily reflect the IWA opinions. It's great seeing so many of you already writing in the chat. It, I can share also here a bit like the chat box, please use it this for actually introduce yourselves, sharing where are you from and also what you work in the water sector. And the Q&A box, just really use it for the questions to send it to the panelists. We will go through them, hopefully a lot of them uh, during the session. So please just use this Q&A box for these questions. And while the chat can be used for general requests and this interaction activity. So now I would like to just briefly mention our great panel that we have here today. As I mentioned, I'm Francisca Braga and I'm the secretary of the Young Water Professionals in Denmark. Then we have Francis and Heather from Cranfield University. Francis will also have this perspective as the student ambassador, while Heather will have more like the academia side as being a senior lecturer. We have then Josh from the Josh Water Jobs, the founder where he will also share a bit with us his own experience and the current trends in the water sector. And Neil, as part of the WACAFED, he'll tell us a little bit about and try to guide us in our careers and hopefully better choices within the water sector as young water professionals. So it's a pleasure having you all here. Um, and then I would like to give the floor to the first presentation. That is maybe the, exactly, thank you so much, Erin. The first presentation that is with Francis and Heather from Cranfield University. You have around 10 minutes and the floor is yours. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as I said, um, my name is uh, Heather Smith, and uh, I'm the course director for the water and wastewater engineering course um, at Cranfield University. Um, and also with us today, we have one of our current students, uh, Francis Sanka. So I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. But um, just to start with, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our perspective we, uh, from how we've been running this course about how things are evolving in, the, in terms of the needs for uh, higher education uh, in the water sector, particularly in, in, in technical skills. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so we run um, and have run for quite some time um, uh, an MSc course, a master's course in, in water and wastewater engineering, um, which is focused on uh, particularly treatment technologies um, and, uh, and, a, and an emphasis on, on public health and treating treating water, both water and wastewater to, to an appropriate standard. So if you can advance a little bit there. We're now shifting that a little bit. Um, so it's no longer gonna be called water and wastewater engineering. It's now going to be called, hopefully, um, this is still subject to university approval, but um, the plan is, is for it to become water and wastewater processes uh, with two routes, um, an engineering route, which was similar to what was before and an environmental science route. And what this change has recognized is that um, the priority of uh, environmental issues has really rocketed up the agenda um, where, where the water sector has very understandably uh, been uh, focused predominantly on public health and treatment engineering for public health uh, for a very long time. The, the priority of, of environmental issues and protecting the environment from um, the harmful effects of uh, things like over abstraction, but also wastewater pollution um, has, has really taken hold. So our course is we're trying to evolve our course to reflect this and provide both um, the, the, an engineering route that is focused, still focused on the treatment, but also an environmental science route where you still learn about the treatment, but, but learn about the the environmental, the impact on the environment as well, and how to how to keep um, a healthy environment. So, so there is a balance there. I think um, both both are becoming very important um, in the water sector. But we still have a challenge. We still um, there's still a gap in terms of the technical skills um, that are uh, evolving in the sector, um, and. I think one of the things that we've seen is, is when we're trying to attract students, um, careers in the water sector are often forgotten. Um, if you have a technical background and if you're looking at a career in a technical subject, um, what the water sector can be can be quite often left behind in some of those discussions. Um, we do think that there's a challenge there where it sometimes has lower pay compared to other utility sectors, um, even though the the significance of it in terms of to say public health and environmental protection um, is huge. And, and there is still quite a strong need for these, um, for people to come into the sector, um, which is partly why we've organized this webinar today, uh, because there are really ambitious requirements. In the UK, um, the, we, the, the water sector here works in, in spending cycles, they're called AMP cycles, and it, that sort of dictate the amount of spend that's gonna happen over a certain period of time. And we're just about to go into a new cycle and the, the total spend for that cycle is predicted to be double, almost double what it was in the previous cycle. And there's a huge need to understand where those people are going to come from, because it's not, you know, the, the technology is there. There are some technological challenges, but but it's really about do we have the people and the people to deliver those that huge ambition in the water sector? And I think that's true elsewhere in the world as well, not, not just in the UK. Um, so we're very keen in our course um, to, to, to attract new people um, to, to, you know, not just those who are, who are in a sort of water background already, but, but who will want to come into the sector and really fill that gap of the technical skills. Um, so with that, I will hand over um, to one of our students who is developing those technical st skills uh, and doing an excellent job on our course. Um, so I will I'll give the floor to you, uh, Francis. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah. So uh, my name is Francis Sanka. I'm originally from Ghana. And um, so my I got into the water sector 
um, working with a multinational company in Ghana. Uh, it's called Coca-Cola Beverages Africa. And we had to deal with drinking water and producing some dairy products. And although my background was more in mining and minerals, but that job offer was actually my initiation or my trajectory into the water sector. So I was like a person who wasn't really having the experience in the water sector until I had that job. And to just create some memories, I shared a few photos to be able to reflect on the growth pattern I've gone through. So as you can see in the middle, um, some of the projects we did with uh, one of the consultants, um, which build a wastewater treatment plant within our two facilities in Ghana. So as you can see, uh, that's me, one of the commissioning and process engineers in the picture. And to the extreme left was um, officially my last day at work when I was in Ghana, as I was about to prepare to do my MSc. And I had to take a picture to reflect on how far I've come. And the one to the right, um, being a field trip we had um, recently on the MSc, as we visited a wastewater treatment plant uh, called Thames Water in London. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, this is just to remind ourselves of what Dr. Heather mentioned concerning the skills we have to deal with, obviously in um, perspective with the sustainable development goals. And currently we've had, um, we have an aging asset force and also, uh, sorry, aging workforce and also assets which are aging out because of the infrastructure. And we also have climate change issues impacting the globe and population growth, which has brought a lot of demand and water stress. So we need to bring new skills, new opportunities, as well as new drivers. And uh, to reflect on the opportunities which we can use to be able to effect the change we want to see, uh, I was thinking through that if there is a resource, and so I talk about resource and, and investment, I'm talking about the, the opportunities made available for young professionals and investing into things like higher education, as well as uh, job opportunities, as well as career guidance, and that also sits with industrial partnerships and networking. So, of course, this event uh, is a networking opportunity because I believe there may be things that may, be, may not be privy to some students or some professionals, but you may get to learn it from this. So I believe these two things are part of the key things that we can leverage on to be able to drive change to um, shorten the uh, diversion from deviation, actually, from climate change and population growth, as well as the workforce and the assets. And we will have to remind ourselves that there will be a few opportunities, or sorry, a few potentials that will be barriers to addressing to stopping these things from coming to pass. So um, one of the barriers will have to do with open access to opportunity. So I noticed that although the internet is a, a very um, open platform, not everybody may have the access to opportunities. For example, things like scholarships, things like uh, job career guidance and all of that. Probably maybe not many people may be on LinkedIn. Maybe not many may also be connecting with the people that pull these things. So sometimes it creates a gap because I believe you've got uh, people with motivation, but sometimes the opportunity is hard to find. And also empowering young professionals. So this has to do with uh, things like uh, gender inequality and things like um, a few things that has to do with in terms of gender and stuff like that. So can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, so this was basically to share some of the rich experience I've had uh, studying my water and wastewater MSc. And I just took a few pictures. Of course, we got a lot of LinkedIn, but just to reflect on the higher education and the technical training uh, with lab assessments, uh, with um, presentations and stuff like that. So the one to the left is basically showing a, a lab activity we had on other processes called advanced oxidation process which is something that I never knew actually. So I've got to learn a lot. And you can see some of us in the lab having to conduct some lab assessments. And to the right was um, a field trip we had with uh, Mogden. So we went to London to visit, um, I believe the third biggest effluent treatment plant in, in the UK, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Um, and how that they're able to treat um, their wastewater. And it was a very huge facility. We got to learn a lot of things. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, at Cranfield, we get to benefit from a very um, elevated learning, uh, excellent academics, and also opportunities to grow, both in the academia and technical side of things. So we learn science with lab stuff, as well as uh, management stuff. Yeah. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, what makes Cranfield unique? Obviously, I'd like to highlight on this because I believe that um, 
higher education is one of the ways we can actually bridge the skill gap because people come to universities obviously to learn the relevant skills, obtain the relevant accreditations and certifications to put themselves in the right position to be able to um, apply for the necessary jobs or the opportunities. So Cranfield has an industry relevant training uh, as our curricula is always almost updated based on the needs of the industry and um, our relationship with um, the industry. So Cranfield is uh, one of the places that I like to say that most of the industries have huge confidence because the training we receive at Cranfield is not just uh, limited to the classroom, it's also comprehensive. And also we have, a, as a postgraduate university, we, we offer a very specialized field of learning. So we, we only do a master's programs and PhD. So it's more like um, a hub for higher learning where people get to research on their specific topics and become specialists or experts, if I should say, on what they're doing. And we have a very unique cost structure. Um, we have a, a thought model component, uh, which we have lecture sessions. We also have a group design project and what makes it interesting is that most of these projects are actually funded by companies, real companies in the UK. So with what I'm working on currently, um, our project is funded by Scottish Water and we're working on uh, recovering some of their resources has to do with methane and making value out of it. And also the individual thesis, they are also most sponsored by industry. So you get to work with clients or people who work in the water sector and that also creates a networking opportunity. The next thing has to do with I've got excellent academics, of course, have been one and facilities. And Cranfield has a state-of-the-art facilities. We've got a pilot plant for both drinking water and wastewater treatment. So uh, for people who are looking to go in the water sector, you get the chance to be able to uh, not just learn things in the classroom, but also be able to apply them in the laboratory and also in the plant. So you see how water is treated and novel innovation that's come to play. And of course, it's all linked to the SDGs. And finally, we've got a global reputation and industrial partnership. So uh, most of the graduates that leave off of the country MSc are highly sought after um, by companies all around the world as we have graduate fairs, we have opportunities and career guidance to help people explore. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I added a few additional resources, which I believe could be beneficial to anybody you may be watching, and hopefully you will need some direction and get opportunities. So the first has to do with our programs, our courses that are done in the uh, in water. So we have the advanced water management, water and sanitation, as well as uh, what I'm doing, the water and wastewater. So depending on your needs and your uh, background, you'll be able to hopefully get one of these things. The next being a, a blog that I wrote, which was published in the Cranfield blogs, you may want to read about what excited me to come to Cranfield and my journey so far. And a few others has to do with scholarships. So most people, like I mentioned, they don't have access to these things. So I thought of maybe putting access to these things so that you could check. So you could check the scholarship opportunities and see if you could hopefully apply for one and also PhD funding. And I'd like to share, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm also a student ambassador. So I'll be happy to chat with any students who may need direction on the course also on find opportunities. You can also reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. Next slide, please. So uh, the job pathways in the water sector just highlighted a few options. So what will a water graduate, somebody who did advanced water, um, water and sanitation or wastewater likely do in the in the near future? So there's pathway for consultancy. Um, I listed a few companies um, which are big companies, multinational um, within UK. So you could get into consultancy, you could get into asset management. So you realize that you could actually get into uh, projects even though you did a water program because we get to learn things that are related to uh, multidisciplinary practices. You could also get into engineering uh, projects, um, process design. You could get into NGOs or partnerships with um, higher institutions like the IWA, UNICEF, DEFRA, you could also potentially get into academia where you get to do a master's by research or a doctoral program or even advance further to become a lecturer. Next slide, please. So um, this is uh, where I stand. So obviously the first picture has to show with um, uh, the kind of limitless opportunities you get to receive. Um, from my personal perspective, reflecting on how far I've come and, and Cranfield sort of positions us in the very uh, right where we have to go. And just to add something, which probably I didn't prepare to add. So thankfully, uh, we, oh, I'm not going to show it. We participated in the challenge. Um, I'm not sure if this can be seen. Oh, unfortunately, it won't be seen. And no problem. Yeah. So 
just to mention that um, there are opportunities to actually um, work with companies and also get awards. So um, I think Helen knows about this. We had a challenge which was funded by Unilever and a few other companies. And thankfully, my team came up to be the challenge winner. And so uh, it's something we're proud of. And just to highlight that there are actually opportunities for people and students who are looking to leverage on them to grow. And so hopefully for my MSc, I'm looking forward to um, becoming a key player in addressing these global issues with water and sanitation and wastewater, as well as energy within the UK and the world at large, and hopefully get to academia with a PhD and get back to my field of work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis and Heather, for this interesting presentation. I once again ask you to start uh, typing your questions in the Q&A box. We will have some of the questions already answered and we'll have in the panel discussion later on also some answered live. So the next presentation is Neil, where he'll guide us in our careers and trying to understand the different paths and how to manage them. The floor is yours, Neil, and welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, it's a big audience, 159. Wow, that's great for a webinar, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to start slightly just going off piste before I start what I was going to say, because there was a couple of, there's a comment and a question I saw that were really interesting. Um, someone called Deborah, Deborah Hood mentioned that 1% of graduates are actually going into the water sector at the moment. I don't know if that's in the UK or, or worldwide, but either way, 1% is, is horrific. And one of the... Um, reasons why i think certainly from a utility perspective because that's where kind of aquafed works in it i just think that utilities are absolutely awful around the world at presenting themselves in a way that shows that they're actually they can be in many cases are thanks deborah it's uk i'm very surprised then because you know there are so many brilliant opportunities for careers and such a range of jobs from engineering to law to you know in terms of customer service finance there's such a range of jobs that, that are out there in utilities but i just think they're just awful at, at showing that actually they can be a dynamic and interesting place to work for young people and there's also a question from daniel from unicef and he's he's i think josh is going to answer it but he's talking about workforce diversity and that unicef are unable to attract more female candidates which again is, is really shocking for me that unicef are finding it difficult but i was involved in a webinar a couple of weeks ago with the German government, and we had um, what I call the, the que some queens of sanitation in, in Africa who are five women who are working and really successfully uh, having great careers in urban sanitation, mostly in utility space. And they talked about very practical things, that cases for women. And it's not about, you know, big ideas about gender equality. And, and, you know, I think women really get that. It came down to simple things like, for example, shift work late at night, you know, was there a bus available for them to to get them from work to home safely some of them can't remember the name um trained them on how to use small motorbikes and scooters so they could get around safely and quickly as safe as you can on a motorbike and um and 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 get to the places of work so it came down to practical steps also things like was the equipment in their size what we find often is in utilities particularly in africa is um, PPE equipment is in men's sizes, yeah, big gloves, big boots. And those were the kind of barriers that actually uh, were the reality for women and that were not being addressed. So anyway, that's um, just some observations on, on, on some questions that, that came up. But OK, um, what I'm here to tell you about, actually, is the career guidance project that Aquafed uh, ran on behalf of the Netherlands government. And this is about an, an idea that came about that basically young people need help careers, uh, and at some point they'll come and work in a utility, but they'll do they want to do all sorts of other jobs in and around the sector as well. And this idea, perhaps in my generation, that people worked in one organisation through their career or most of their career, we understand that young people don't really want to do that anymore, and they want to have variety and and try different things and have different experiences. So really, the responsibility is on institutions like water utilities and other service providers to make uh, what we do as part of a career plan for a young person. Some some key things apply because I'm going to show you some actual successes. I'm not going to just show you the problems. There are definitely solutions out there. The key thing about developing 
young people in their careers. Number one is about partnership between institutions. And where we've seen that, uh, what I, by that I mean, say, a utility and a training college. It sounds so easy, but when it works, it really, really works very well. Um, leadership and commitment to youth from a nice a wish list, something we all want. And it's a shame that leaders in our sector don't often see it as their role. But when it works, it works very, very well. And they show that they have vision and they show that investing in young people is actually an investment in the organization that they work for. So that's very, very important, I think, just seeing young people as an investment. So yeah, next next slide, please. Okay, so this was uh, a project basically in two, in two steps, right? So first of all, it was that we did a little bit of research and I know in the sector, we love doing research, highlighting the same problems again and again. So forgive me slightly, but I needed some of the data to then do the second part of the project, which is actually to create guidance for utility managers and specifically on to so they can understand what routes young people could come in to work for a utility where they could come from what their career aspirations are and where they want to go to afterwards so what this guidance does is or is meant to do is help a utility manager particularly in the global south because that's where it was focused on to um, set up training programs and recruit in a way that's going to help young people with their overall career so it sounds, you know, a bit very, very, a nice, very nice thing to do. And we hope now that we can actually start implementing it and get getting some traction and getting utility managers to actually use it. But that's the the, the real idea for it. The, the idea for this concept of career careers management hasn't just something that we've dreamed up. It's actually come from listening from from young people for about, I don't know, for me, it's been about five years now. I've been engaging with young people in various stages and various reasons uh, in my role in the sector. But also as Aquafed, as we're private operators, when we come into, uh, when we're brought in to run a service, the first thing we do is if we come in to run a utility, for example, is address the human resource issues and make sure everyone is there, who, everyone who is there is skilled up properly, whether they're young or women or whoever, they, they we need to upskill everyone. So this is what we've heard from listening to people is that we need to help manage Young, young people manage their careers much better. Uh, ne next slide, please. All right, so just to quickly on the research, I, sadly, I don't think this is anything surprising to most of you. And what it showed, sadly, I don't wish to be dramatic, but there was a systemic failure uh, by the water sector in, in supporting young people. And this, this is a survey of young people and, and service managers in the global South, particularly Africa and Latin America. Things like 40, maybe basically half the employers have less than 20% of staff under 25. Nearly half of them had absolutely no plan or strategy whatsoever to recruit young people. 50% um, of job opportunities for young people not advertised. And the last two statistics, particularly um, 66 of young percent of young people interviewed who are young people who want to work in the sector are still looking for a job. And 50% have been forced down the self-employment route uh, because of lack of opportunity. So th that was pretty startling. But it's really, we also found in this kind of depressing um, show, we also found some, some examples, which I'll give you very, very quickly now, because I know I'm nearly running out of time. Next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned... Um, partnership at the beginning and these were two examples bali bargo is um, a, a member of aquafed actually it's a, a company in the, in the in the philippines and there's this other example of um a partnership in senegal and in both cases it is at different levels it is examples of or they are examples of where young people are being bought in and trained and in, in the case of bali bargo now bali bargo is going into schools and starting there and starting to get young people interested in what they do as a utility company and a water provider company at school level and trying to build that interest. Um, same with Seno in Senegal, it's a partnership between the utility and the training school and they're training plumbers because there's there are opportunities for higher education, you know, doctorates and all this, but, but actually what we hear from utility managers a lot in the global south is that you, we need people who are have got more basic level skills like plumbing, for example, right? It's really, really important to keep the, the, the treatment plants going. So in both cases, partnership is key. And again, in these cases, leadership and commitment from people who 
our managers and they recognize the importance of young people they they've been key to the success in these areas um next slide please uh in this case this is about again we with the problem was you know one of the, the the problems we found was that there's too many barriers to young people's employment in the sector and i'm sure the young people here many of you you don't need me to tell you that you see it already but there are in amongst the problems there are solutions two examples here one was brazil and one's more more global but in both cases there are kind of ongoing opportunities for ongoing training and ongoing relationship um, starting from career fairs to to attract people to 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 working for a utility or working for a service and then providing training further on whether it's online or in the case of brazil it's actually one-to-one -one. so i think it was quite good that we had this the association of sanitation and environmental engineering really taking this this issue of young people's recruitment they clearly understand that there is an issue going forward and you know you've got a kind of aging population of old engineers in brazil that we need to bring the next generation on so they understood it there so it's a, a, some great examples uh, finally, next slide, please. I showed these these two. One is in Peru and one is in Myanmar. Because it just goes to show that really with the right attitude and the right focus from, in this case, in both cases, I think it's public authorities, again, who understand the value of young people in the sector. It doesn't matter where you are in the world and where economically a country is and what factors are going on. In Myanmar and Peru, they have shown us in both cases a deep commitment, I think, to to developing young people. And it, it, it's an example for many other countries that actually sometimes everyone says, oh, we need more money. We need more money. That's not necessarily true. In these cases of Peru and Myanmar, they have just pulled together the resources in partnership that are that are available and use them to the best of their ability. And that in Peru, for example, they're able to provide uh, training and courses free of charge. And in Myanmar, they have um, put in place detailed programs and really thought out what they can offer people, young people particularly, to develop their careers. All right. So what my, my main focus was really just to show you that despite all the gloom and, you know, and the fact that it's difficult for young people, there are examples out there. There are solutions that we hope others can follow. Voila. Thank you very much. Sorry for, sir, for taking so long. No worries. Thank you so much, okay. Neil. And it was great that you had already answered some of the questions. The last presentation is John from Josh Water Jobs. He will tell us also a little bit about his personal experience and the current employment trends. Once again, please answer all your questions in the Q&A box. And then next, uh, after the, the, the Josh presentation, we will answer them, hopefully, in the panel discussion. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there's actually, a, I could spend the next 10 minutes just talking about what's been talked about already and responding to that. But I'll try, I'll go into, uh, yeah, what I was going to talk about, which will be, I'll divide into th kind of three different pillars. One is what I'm seeing through the website in terms of trends and like where the jobs are. Um, and then uh a second part on the skills that I'm seeing that are in demand. And this is also from my own, a lot of this is anecdotal too, my own experience and having looked at so many job descriptions over the past, uh, what, 10 years um, and seeing what's there and how things are changing. And then the last part will be kind of pieces of it in this yeah. landscape to kind of, um, to sort of finer tune the job search and things you can do to to help your help you get a job if you're looking. Um, so yeah, so obviously this is a very important subject of, of of mine, and recently decided that I'm going to go full in on working on Josh's Water Jobs, the website, and leaving my other work behind. Um, because there are so, as, as we've heard the speakers say, the, there is such a, 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 uh, there's already issues around human resources in water and sanitation. Um, and it's just going to get worse. And that's because, uh, of what was, has been mentioned with the aging workforce. But if, if you think about there's still 2 billion people in the world that lack 
uh, safe, affordable access to water, to drinking water and uh, sanitation that's much higher. We don't have the people to actually bridge that number. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a massive uh, undertaking if we are actually to achieve uh, those goals. And, um, but it also has to be prioritized by governments in order to do that, um, even if the needs are there. So anyway, on what I'm seeing through the website uh, is that, um, and, and as you know, we're talking about water and sanitation, not as much about water resources management and those types of jobs. So I'll try to focus more on that. But, um, you know, engineers uh, are in a constant demand and rising um, as less people go into uh, engineering programs worldwide. Uh, that that's a trend. Um, the demand becomes higher, and as we have these increased demands on 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 um, uh, increasing access to water and sanitation and wastewater treatment, um, those demands are are continuous and will be on the rise. So that that's definitely, and I definitely see that through the through the jobs that come across the website. Um, and it's maybe not so much this audience, um, but, uh, and it was mentioned that the majority of the jobs are going to be at the vocational technical level. They're not going to be at the bachelor degree level and higher, um, where the gap is, is going to be more at the technical vocational level. And that's the need, the, there's already gaps there. Um, and, and this is everywhere. I was talking to someone from a small town in New England in the U S a, a few weeks ago, um, and they're having problem finding people, um, to go to these, uh, especially rural areas to work, uh, in the, in the, in these areas. Um, one thing that I hear a lot about now and I'm seeing a lot as well, uh, is, uh, in terms of the jobs and, and this is also in the skills part is the, the technology, the kind of technology oriented jobs, data oriented jobs, because the, you know, the digitalization of the water sector um, is happening, maybe not as fast as other sectors, but it's happening. And so those, and those jobs are, are starting to appear. Um, and then humanitarian water sanitation hygiene, because there is definitely a link to that. Um, as long as there's conflict, as long as there are disasters, those jobs will always be there, unfortunately. Um, so those those over the, the 10 plus years have been doing the lists have, have been pretty consistent and even have there's been when disasters happen, when wars happen, there's an uptick in these jobs that are out there. So um, and it's been mentioned a lot, especially because of what uh, Cranfield focuses on, but wastewater. Um, you know, the global data quite isn't there, but it's thought that our only twenty percent of the of wastewater worldwide is collected and treated, um, and that's mostly in developed countries. So um, there's a huge potential there to move in that direction to you know collecting, recycling, and reusing, and we're going to go that direction. So the work opportunities are going to be there. What I've been seeing more and more often with uh, kind of all these spaces, but the biggest change has come in the wash space, the water and sanitation space, is wash and climate change, wash and climate change adaptation. <clears throat> and this, I would say, is only in the last year or two where there are more and more jobs that are really looking at, okay, climate change is happening. How do we adapt to that in the in the water utility sector? How do we um adapt to that in terms of humanitarian efforts water sanitation hygiene and those jobs uh and i just posted a few this morning i think uh or yesterday um so they're out there and they're increasing in number um and then <clears throat> private sector this isn't as much water sanitation but it's it's uh in terms of the what i'm seeing is increasing this water stewardship jobs which has its links as well but again it's uh in terms of you know, the bottom line of companies is being put at risk um, by climate change and, and, uh, and other factors. So there are more positions and organizations who are helping companies deal with their with their water risk. Um, so that's kind of what I'm seeing anecdotally. Um, and then on the, the skills side, um, I, I do promise to have hard data on this um, in the future. 
um, as I as I make this shift and have access to a database of 70,000 jobs and can mine that uh, for a lot of information on what skills are in demand actually for jobs. But in terms of like, again, anecdotally, what I've seen um, is that obviously there's no skill set that's a silver bullet um, for, because there's so many different types of water jobs out there. Uh, so there's no one skill that's going to, you know, capture everything you can do for all water jobs. So it really depends on what um, you want to be doing. Um, program management, I, 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 was, I argue that this is a really good one, especially if we're talking about the level that we're talking, you know, this audience more or less is, you know, bachelors and higher for the most part, I'm guessing. Um, program management is super important. I can't tell you how many organizations uh, they look for good program managers and they'd love to have a good program manager who also has a background in water or sanitation. Um, so having that skill is really important. That will get you a job to have experience in that. And it also helps you as you advance in your career as well with more responsibility because that usually comes with more management um, obviously what I mentioned before on, you know, data technology, digital AI, I mean, even myself, I'm a, you know, social scientist, I work on, uh, international affairs with water. Like I use chat GPT every week, if not every day. Um, so those types of skills are going to be, are going to be very useful to have to know how to utilize them for jobs. Um, so, and I, you know, you, I start to see that a little bit in job descriptions, um, that they want, uh, people who are skilled in, in those, uh, in those areas. Um, I'm a big proponent of soft skills. And actually I hear this a lot from young professionals, uh, more so than senior professionals in terms of what they would want uh, in terms of additional training is on the soft skills. So negotiation skills, conflict resolution, writing, communication, leadership, problem solving, teamwork. Those are all things that I think that the more you have of them and the more you can demonstrate that you're that you that you have them, you're good at them, the it'll increase your chances of, of getting a job. Um so I think I'll end there because my time is coming to an end and I want to get to the last bit. Um so what can you do? I'm just, I'll go through these quickly, happy to answer offline or in the Q&A about more about. But one, um, uh, it was the best advice I ever got. Um, many of you probably heard me say this before, but it's it was a, an advisor of mine who said, you know, those who move create their own luck. So if you put yourself out there, you go try to talk to people, you um, network, build community, all that stuff, things happen. Um, so the more you move, the more you do, the more you put yourself out there, the more luck that you create around you uh, and more things happen. Um, find mentors, uh, those senior to you, but also your peers, because you learn often just as much from your peers as you do from senior professionals. And also be a mentor. I think that also is an experience that, that gives you a, a lot back and um, so yeah, find a mentor, be a mentor, get involved in the youth networks. Um, you can see a blog on my post, a blog on my website about all the, the ones that are out there, but get involved because those provide opportunities that you never potentially could have had before. Um, so I encourage you to in, engage in youth networks at whatever level. Um, stay busy even when you're not working. Um, I have had times where I, uh, haven't had work. And so that's how the website actually came about however many years ago. Um, but stay busy, be productive, volunteer, intern, write, learn, do social media, um, just continue to, to enhance your who you are as, as a professional. I really advocate for studying job descriptions of jobs that you aspire to um, and wherever that, whether that's on my website or ever anywhere else, just if there's a job in a few years down the road, we'll study those job descriptions, see what skills and demand are in demand for them and try to get those skills. Um, and then work on your soft skills. Like I said, you may not find these in any kind of water oriented training, but they're, uh, but definitely uh, try to, own them um, because these are still very people-oriented jobs in many ways and those soft skills come in very handy. 
uh, do informational interviews, go to organizations you want to work for and just sit down and chat with people about what it's like to work there. Um, so it kind of gets you on their radar and you learn more about the organization. Um, and then look at what is in demand for jobs and go where the demand is. Um, yeah, and then just learn, continue to learn wherever you are, no matter what the job is, how much you like it or not, there's always something to learn. So just continue to do that, work hard. Um, and then, yeah, most of all, stay with us in, in water and sanitation because we need you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. That was really great advice and I completely agree. And now we have, I guess, also the, the interesting part and more interactive part where we have our panel discussion. Uh, well, it will be around 50 minutes. We have here already some questions popping up, which is also great. And then I would like also first just to give the floor to Chelsea, that she is part of like the Young Water Professionals Steering Committee. And she's also here with us today. Um, and I think you have some questions, Chelsea, if you would like to ask one of them to our panelists, that will be great. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, it was really great to hear from all of our panelists this evening. And um, something that came up, I think, a couple of times, definitely relevant to um, like Josh brought it up and I know Neil kind of alluded to it. And I and I hope that um, Francis has been able to experience um, this through his um, studies and career, but that's around mentorship. So my question is, how can mentorship programs be structured to support skills development and career advancement for young professionals? Thank you so much, Chelsea. I don't know which one of the panelists would like to, to start. Well, I can have I can have a quick go because um, it's something we've we've um, incorporated um, we've had a go at as part of our um, course. Uh, the, one of the challenges we had was retaining mentors, unfortunately, um, because they, although they 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 found they really enjoyed it, um, and uh, following on what Josh said, um, the the mentors I think got as much out of it as the mentees did. Um, the uh, it was. <sighs> Yeah, it was it was it was a struggle for people to to maintain to feel they could maintain some some level of commitment to it. But I think having um, having it in some kind of um, structured setting where somebody can make uh, an introduction for you can can definitely help and who can, uh, you know, provide a, a forum where you can arrange at least some of the first um, um, conversations that you have. You don't have to have in person meetings necessarily. Um, can certainly can certainly help. Um, so if yeah, if you can do it through some kind of formalized approach, whether that's through the IWA or through um, uh, a, a course that you do, or you know, a, an organization that can help make that introduction for you and help you set up those first uh, and sort of help you find someone initially, um, uh, that can certainly help. But there's nothing there's nothing stopping you from from doing it in a more informal way of of approaching somebody on LinkedIn and just saying, hey, can we have a chat? Um, and that is uh, that is also perfectly plausible and and, uh, and and can can work as well. So I don't think there's a single answer to that, but I think there's there's quite a range of possibilities that could work. Thank you so much, Heather. I don't know if any of you the others like to. I was, just, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to jump in from my own personal experience of not being a very good mentor actually a couple of years ago I took on a young guy for the last before the last world water forum from from DRC and the problem was I think two things and it's, it's my fault not his he, he wasn't clear with me exactly about what he wanted the mentorship program to look like and how I could really help him and I think it had to be led by him, actually. It's really important, whoever you are, if you want to mentor, and I said this in, in the Q&A to someone, really be clear about what it is you want first. And you need to really think hard about it. And then you can find, hopefully, the right mentor to suit you. Because otherwise, it becomes a bit half and half. And I was trying to, I was struggling to think of things that I thought might be useful for him in his context. And sitting in London, I have really not much idea of what life's really like for him. So I think mentorship needs to start with the young person and, and not the other way around. And based on your needs and finding someone that helps you. Thank you so much, Neil. I think that also goes a bit what Josh was talking about for us to get out of our comfort zone and get out there. 
I have you here know, a really yeah. Yeah. So I like to add a little contribution from a student perspective. So um usually it's better when uh, maybe other students initially. So from my perspective, before I got to do my MSc, I had a few uh, colleagues from my university back home who had also done an MSc in the same program I was doing. So I was able to reach out to them and sometimes they're able to direct you as in the right corner who to talk with because they may know things that connect with professionals or uh, recruiters or people who are looking for people to probably uh, offer them support. So it's like they could help in the right direction. So I think that could be a, a leading factor. If students could know how, just like um, a wonderful panelist mentioned, they could just connect to somebody over LinkedIn or in, a, or in a webinar like this. You could just reach out to somebody and hopefully as long as it's well structured, they could point you in the right direction if they themselves are not sure, but they could point you out. Thank you so much, Francis, for your input as well. We have here a really interesting question for Megana uh, that I think it will be interesting also to, to get it live for all of you. And it's regarding that her question is, for example, institutes like United Nations that are happy to engage with the youth, but the internships are normally unpaid or with a bare minimum of paint in terms of these concept water jobs. Um, and we needed, like, of course, to, to get paid. And why is the jobs sector not speaking out against these issues? Um, and this is also a way that everyone wants to attract skills and talent, but it guess that they don't want to pay the young water professionals. So how can we try to remain, uh, try to maintain this talent in the sector, also for to not go for other sectors like energy and so on, and give them opportunity actually to growth. Either you, you ask me if you could also like give uh, uh, an answer about this, so you can go first. I don't want to promise too much. I'm not sure I can actually, <laughs> I can't fully answer this question. No, but it is, it, it is something I wanted to speak to you because it is, um, it is a really important question. I've seen the cut, the, the discussion about pay comes up, um, quite a lot. Um, I'll come back to the subject of, of the unpaid internships, which is something slightly different, but, but in terms of just jobs in the sector, um, and e even entry level jobs, um, there can be a challenge with pay in terms of them. As I mentioned at the beginning, we often see uh, that the water sector on the whole tends to pay often less than than some other comparable sectors, you know, particularly like the energy sector. And that's always been a challenge. I think the but it, it come, it's one that is really not easy to address. You know, it's one thing to just say that, oh, they should just pay more. And on, on the one hand, that's I would love for that to be true. But, um, you know, this is also a very regulated sector. And um, often that pay, to some degree, comes back to what water customers are willing to pay for water, which is also a challenge. Um, and and if if we as customers aren't prepared to pay a lot for water services because we have to keep them affordable, then that will unfortunately have knock on consequences to how much the sector is able to pay its employees. Um, and that is a, a paradox that we don't have an easy way out of. Um, it's, uh, you know, the more, the, more the, the more that labor costs in the sector, then that will have knock on implications for the price of the water. It, it, you, you can't, you can't completely separate those two. Um, so so it is it is a challenge. I think I think the, the water sector will always to a degree have to depend on the passion and enthusiasm of the people who come into it and their and their desire to work in, in this important sector, um, which may mean that they're they had they they are paid less um, but are are happy with the reward that comes with that. It's not an ideal answer, but it it it, it seems to be to be where we are because that's the challenge we face. Having said that, I I don't ever encourage my students to take unpaid internships because I don't I don't often agree with the practice of unpaid internships. I think they can be they can work in some circumstances, but they can be very exploitative and obviously they they can be quite um, uh, geared towards you know people who have the means to support themselves. <laughs> Uh, through the unpaid internships. So 
you know, I did, I did an unpaid internship when I was, um, uh, you know, much younger and I, I was fortunate enough to have the position to do it. They can absolutely give you some good skills if you are not putting yourself in, in difficulty to undertake one. Um, but it does, it does create a divide between those who, who can and the, who can support themselves and those who can't. So, so it, that is also a tricky, uh, tricky problem. I would, I would, I think there are enough paid entry level jobs in the sector, um, that I think, you, it, it's not strictly necessary for you to do an unpaid internship in order to get into the sector. Um, and, and I just want to come back to one other question, which I think Kristen, Kirsten had asked um, on, on the sort of um, the, the, the uh, availability of jobs and, and are there any examples of um, jobs with proper career progression in place? I think in the UK, I think I have seen some examples of that. I don't. I wouldn't say the water companies themselves are necessarily perfect at it, although it varies a lot between companies. Um, some, some I think are much better than others. But um, the the international consultancies are increasingly very, very aware of this, and they're through their graduate schemes and their um, even some of their non graduate schemes, just but just sort of entry level roles. Um, they 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 try hard to offer different progression pathways and lots of different development opportunities. Right now, I'm also in um, I'm doing a secondment with Offwat, which is the UK water sector regulator. I've seen some fantastic skills development opportunities that they offer for their new recruits. Um, so as a you know as a as an employer in the water sector, they the regulators, government uh, departments, can uh, public sector can often offer some some quite good career pathways as well. So I'll leave it there. That's just my, my, my thoughts on those two. Perfect. Thank you so much, Heather, that you already joined also two questions into one, which is perfect. I don't know if any of the other panelists will also like Josh. Yeah, on the paid internship uh, question. So last year, I took the decision to not put unpaid internships on the website anymore. Um, so I, every internship that is on the website, I look very carefully to see whether there is a there is compensation or not. Um, and I'm finding that there aren't very many internships anymore that are not compensated. Um, I can actually tell you what organizations don't. I won't because that's, or maybe I should to shame them, but um, and the United Nations has changed. It's not there. The main United Nations, New York with its associated agencies does not pay still. But also if you think about how many of uh, internships they're offering in water, it's not very many compared to what's out there. The couple dozen maybe at the very most. So whereas a city might have more internships than the than in one in one city may have more internships than the whole U UN does. So yes, so the UN but other UN agencies, UNICEF, UNDP, they pay their interns now. Um and yeah, there's a few international NGOs that I'm very surprised at that don't pay their internships, but basically everybody else these days are are compensating their interns. So that definitely has shifted over the years. Um, and some I, I see that they have entry level level hourly pay. Um, so they're very they're very competitive, at least in in water. But yeah, I completely agree with what Heather said about uh, how the difficulty of the the pay. Um, and I was just doing a little bit of work with the World Bank on this and looking at utilities and how you can actually attract younger people to work in utilities and looking at compensation packages. So yes, the pay is different, but pay isn't the only compensation that you can provide, um, especially younger generation likes more flexibility, working from home, working from other places. So you can look at different types of packages that could make it more attractive um, with pay being a limiting factor. Uh, but but as Heather said, it's very it's it's complicated. But but there are other ways um, to address that. Thanks. I, I think also just to jump in on that, this idea of you know uh, good pay and compensation in a package is a very some well this is what young people have told me. It's a very northern hemisphere thing, and in the south, what I hear from young people is that they just want a job. Right. Not that's going to pay them nothing, but it's just basic. You know, when we have I've spoken to young people in, in the South through the, the research we did and they were just saying to me, look, Neil, just don't talk to me about this kind of um, this kind of advanced ideas, you know, on, on career paths and all these things. We just want a job. It was as simple as that. So I think it really depends on the context sometimes as well. 
uh, in which we we speak quite honestly. It, that's look, that's not me uh, or my personal opinion. I'm just voicing uh, what young people from South told us during the the, the survey work. Thank you so much, Neil. We have here a question regarding also uh, from Enriqueta. Uh, how can the war sector attract more women? Because generally it's like a sector and also in terms of engineering that comes from more like male um, education. How can we attract uh, more women in terms of like recruitment, flexi hours, and, uh, and if how they can have it like in terms of qualification in the war sector? I don't know if any of you would like to answer this. Go for it, Josh. Yeah. So, so I, I have a talk on this that I could give some time uh, that I that, that I did for uh, Women's Day last year. Um, and in, in a, Neil already mentioned some things in what he said. Um, and another a, a great resource is to look at what Equal Aqua at the World Bank is doing. Uh, with women and breaking the barriers down to getting more women in the water and sanitation sector. Um, what the a lot of what I talk about is even more basic than that. and it's it's how you frame job descriptions. It's how and, and, and I mean, the question already mentioned it. it's the 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 benefits package in terms of maternity leave and those types of um, uh, benefits that are uh, that are that women want more and are good in, in for them than than exist or just not addressed because it's been always been a male dominated sector. Um, and so, but yeah, the, the, there's a lot on the hiring process, how you market the job, the words you use in the job description that are not so male oriented. Um, there's, you know, the hiring committee that it's gender balanced. There's a lot of things and none of them are, are not that hard uh, that that can make uh, even just the entry into applying for a job more attractive uh, for women. Uh, but there's a lot, there's a lot of material out there um, about how to do this, but then it is like, yeah, where the rubber hits the road is actually having utilities, organizations, companies actually implementing these in the, in their practices for hiring. Thank you so much. I don't know if uh, any other panelists would like to add something. No, I think the main, when we can also move on, we also have here Yang from the Young Water Professional Steering Committee. Yeah, he's here with us. Uh, thank you so much, Yang, also for being here. And I guess you also have some questions that you would like also to, like to the panelists. The floor is yours. I do. Thank you, Francisca. And, and uh, congratulations to our speakers for such insightful um, comments. This question is more for those who are already in the workplace and find themselves in a situation where their skills development is often driven by or even dictated by their manager or their superior. So how do you suggest should young people take charge of their own skills development and how can they realistically do that? It's a really good question. Um, uh, the simple answer is yes, they should. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it, I, I, but I fully recognize um, the, the the challenge in in doing that. I think a lot, I mean, it's easy to say as as kind of someone in a, a more advanced career state, but uh, I always wish when I was younger that I, I had tried to develop a much better sense of, what actually motivated me and to sort of develop skills along those lines, um, you know, like really think hard about what, what you feel rewarded from, what, what, um, what motivates you as an individual uh, to try and see if you can uh, sort of design or develop your skill sets um, in line with that. Um, as I say, it's much easier for me to, to say that now, but uh, but a good a lot of thinking early on about about that I think I think can go a long way. But yeah, it is it is really important to think through and and to to carry that into any interviews you do. You know, ask whatever interview you do, ask questions about what um, skills development uh, potential is on offer. Try and get a sense whether you would have a, 
a line manager who is receptive to that. You know, a good line manager, a good line manager will should try and work with uh, or supervisor, or PhD supervisor, or whatever it is, um, mentor should try and work with the person to to understand these motivational issues and 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 help design something that is that can work. You know, and 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 so whatever opportunity you take, it's always good to get a sense of whether the person who will be in charge of you or supervising you during that opportunity will be open to you wanting more skills development. And so you can have a conversation about what that might look like. But yes, I would say absolutely try where you can to understand what you want and how you can, how you can go about that. Yeah, I've got a, a little contribution on that. Yeah, so yeah, uh, following up from what Dr. Heather said, I believe that uh, particularly with even job offers, um, from what the uh, panelist said, you should obviously have a, a good understanding on the job description and hopefully, and possibly know what kind of job you're going in for. So I think that could be a beginning ground. And I think from what I've seen so far, um, some of the companies, particularly within the UK, uh, with their graduate program scheme, they offer a career progression pathway. So they have uh, sessions that people are, they may be rotated through different uh, parts of the of the sector or the department. And after that, hopefully if you're good enough or you, you have a good uh, performance, you could be given uh, a higher role. And I think, like she said, you should be self-driven, but I think the most uh, deciding factor is where you're starting from, because um, obviously you're starting from, um, let's say a design engineering sense of um, approach. You would obviously know how you could progress forward. You're starting from um, an asset management approach, you would obviously have an understanding. So I think people should obviously have an understanding of what they want to start from and uh, develop a good relationship. And that could be um, helpful in getting a career path. Do you mind if I just make one more comment, Francisca? Yes, go ahead. Um, because, because I've also just noticed a comment in, in, in the chat. Um, so one, again, one way, I'm, and I'm going to be, I'm obviously a little biased in how I say this, but one one way for people to take charge is through the educational pathways, and if you do have the opportunity to take on a, a master's degree or another, um, you know, training course of some description, um, that is one way you can you can do that. So yeah, I had a, a, a lead a master's course that is of those of that type, but there are many, there are many others, um, and I know it's I fully recognize that is a can be a huge financial commitment and a very very difficult one. Um, but, I, you know, do have a look at some of the scholarships um, and the flexibility of those scholarships um, that are available, because sometimes that can, a lot of people dismiss the idea, but that there are, um, there are potentially a lot more opportunities there than you think. Um, and, and Henrietta had a question there about um, uh, getting women into the, uh, into these educational pathways as well, not necessarily just in jobs. Uh, and again, those scholarships can be more flexible than you realize. One um, scholarship program I'm aware of um, was trying to make allowances for um, dependents as well. So like, you know, to 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 support dependents if um, if, the, if the, uh, uh, a woman is a, a carer and has children, if anybody in family circumstances, you know, the, the, the scholarship would account for that and potentially, um, you know, still allow for that family support as well as attending university. So there are, you know, I'm not saying it's common, but there are some scholarship schemes that that try hard to account for this. And will, uh, and I think that's one way of hopefully getting more women into the, onto those educational pathways as well. We've, we've had some quite successful examples on our course, certainly. Thank you so much. And we've been talking also here a bit about like skills. And we have a question here from Nicole that in addition to use the words climate resilience or climate adaptive, what are differences in skills in requirements or jobs that you're seeing now when people are hiring for those climate change skills? And then also maybe some skills that you think it could be required in the future. I don't know which one of you would like to answer this. Do you know on 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 yeah on the question of skills of the future and i know this is one of the questions we were going to come about um i would turn this question on its head a little bit actually and I, and again through part of the inspiration for the career pathways project was again by listening to young people and actually observing the way they work and they want to work and their mindset to work that's what influenced our project and and wanted made us want to do it in the first place and by that i mean 
sometimes down to simple things like obvious things like digital skills, which young people have in abundance compared to, again, someone in my generation, a utility. I don't want to characterize it, but we heard, for example, during the pandemic, we had utility managers in Africa saying that for the first time, the pandemic forced them to go on to email. OK, it's that basic. They went on, they set up their own Gmail accounts for the first time. They didn't have any WhatsApp groups. They set those up and necessity forced them to advance in that way. Just imagine if they had a young person working with them who is digitally literate, could have done all of that for them in five minutes. All right. And there are still organizations. You know, there is a huge difference between the way we see some of the companies in, in Northern Europe, for example, and, and how advanced they are and other places compared to places in the global south where we still have a situation where we have managers who still are not are just barely using using email, for example. And there's things and the, the, the whole mindset that young people have to work and the tools they have, whether it's mirror boards or or this kind of thing and, and how young people are just totally capable of working virtually and getting things done that way in a way, again, that I think people like me are just not very good at right that's the kind of thing so my point is that actually young people should be showing and and be actively promoting the skills you have and your mindset to work and presenting it as something different to what already exists just in in general terms and i think that's really important and i hope that as young people you don't lose sight of that and you really understand that you are at the next level and the next wave in way working life's going to be and you should be setting the tone for that now Thank you so much. I don't know if any of the others would like to add something. If not, then we also have here a question from Nandita, which asks, what have your experience been on moving out of a niche subject into the wider water scope? If you suggested trying different types of jobs in the wash sector, or do you suggest staying in the niche and then being more like a an expert in that niche, in that specific subject. I think that's also a quite tricky question, Josh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, there's no right or wrong um, to, to that, to that, because we need both. We need specialists and we need generalists. We need people who are bigger picture thinkers that can connect the specialties um, so they are optimal in how they are they work together, and we need the people who work in niche, niche subjects because we need a high level of expertise in those. So there's no right or wrong. Uh, it's basically on on your preference about where you think you can add value the most. Um, that's how I would see it. I don't know if either you like to say something, Francis or Neil. Well, the yeah, as you said, there's not an easy, there isn't a, a one right answer to that. Um, it, it, I said I think there's nothing wrong with if you've tried something and you find it's not for you to try and switch. <laughs> um, that is absolutely there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and a lot of um, you know em employers are, are are quite understanding of that. Uh, I have I, I've mentioned in one of the answers I put in the in the Q and A that um, in some of the bigger companies. I'm thinking more of consultancies here, but I think I know some water companies have tried this as well. Um, they sometimes offer that, that you can try out different things. Like you can work over in this bit of the company for a bit, but then if that doesn't work out for you, you can move over to this other bit of the company and try that. You know, there's there's a lot of different ranges of, of options, you, whether it's something operational or something planning or something. Yeah, you know, the, the, there's multiple pathways. So so that there might be something, you know, within that that you could try out different things anyway, depending on which company you're working with. But even if that's not the case, I don't think there's, I don't think it's a bad thing to try out um, different options or to try the same topic from different angles. <laughs> um, but yes, you do. You, you at some point you run into the balance of having to build up a skill set in something so that you know you can you can build up your career and move forward. Uh, rather than just continually moving sideways. But yeah, a little bit of experimentation, I think, is not, is not generally a bad thing. Thank you so much. I have to admit that I completely agree with that as well. Um, continue so, to Francesca, yeah. can I just make, make a, yeah, a general yeah. point overall? Because 
of course, with sessions like this, we hear all sorts of really, really good examples of what works, right? But again, if I'm one of the young people, young person watching this now, and I'm looking for a job, and I'm thinking, well, why the hell is it not happening? Yeah, what one of one of the solutions is, quite honestly, and this is where we have to get into the advocacy even more, is that th there is that phrase, isn't there, that th those who pay the piper call the tune, right? Which means it's an old English phrase, but it basically means those with the money. Uh, money talks yeah and the funders in the sector so whether it's development banks or the UN agencies I think there's more responsibility on them quite honestly to when they are awarding uh, money and grants and funds to uh, service providers that they have to make it a condition more really strongly make it a condition about career training and development I think that's one area that can really make a big advancement it's not a new idea but I see it all the time whereby, you know, grants are given and it should be a condition that training and development of young people is part of that. We're starting to see it more now in PPP contracts that private operators have, whereby quite rightly, the public authority is saying as part of this contract, one of the things you have to deliver as well as service improvements are also uh, upskilling of of, of um of the workforce as well and, and increasing opportunities for them. And that's quite right. It should be in the contract. So there's an, a direct opportunity for the public authority to really take it seriously and make it a condition of action. Otherwise, we're going to be sit here for years just talking about what, what works in small pockets. But to make that big leap, I think the funders have got a much bigger role to play than they do now. And I don't I don't think I don't just don't think they take it seriously enough either. Excuse the rant, but it's not just anger that I'm talking through. It's about actual observation. And I see I can see Henrietta's great. Well, that's, that's great. Right. So there's an example of where the EBRD is doing it. Yeah, is doing it in certain cases. And I think that's great. And that, that that's more of it. But I, I don't see it enough from, from the operator side. We don't see it enough where where it's a condition of, of the grant or the service. But it's great, Henrietta. Thank you for your intervention. Thank you so much. I also saw here in the questions, Francis, that you'd like to yeah. answer one live regarding the developing countries. Maybe you can share yes. a bit of your experience. All right. Yeah. So um reflecting on that question, I my, my personal opinion is I think it uh, relates more with the interests of the, the students or the candidates. Just let Obviously. me, let me, sorry, let me interrupt you a bit, but I'll just read the question because I think some right. of you will not be able to, to have it. So the question from Anne is like, if we have suggestions how to reverse brain drain for developing countries and make water graduates to go back and work in their countries. The floor right. is yours. No, yeah. no, Francis, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, my, my opinion is that I, I feel it's more of a, a personal or it's more related to the candidates or the students more than um, the wider picture. So obviously uh, somebody coming for higher learning is obviously coming for some reasons. Um, it could be to upgrade their skills. It could be to potentially um, get to have some international experience and exposure. It could be also to return to the home country and contribute to addressing the water and sanitation issues in the country. So. Um, if you call it more of a brain drain, I, I'm not sure how that, but I think, of course, it depends. Because if the candidate is done, and uh, hopefully there are the opportunities for them to probably get into jobs in their home country. Because I remember for some of the students that we've had, some people struggle to, they mentioned that usually uh, they struggle to adjust when it comes to returning to home country and working for companies. Because usually maybe some, sometimes the difference of the huge knowledge they've received and also trying to apply to a small scale. So I think it depends on your personal interests. And I'm sure there are companies that also are in developing countries and also as long as wide as um, UNICEF, UN and all these companies that do projects across the developing countries, you could actually position yourself to really work with them or do something like that. Hopefully if you want to get back to uh, that setting, I hope that helps. Thank you so much. I don't know if uh, the other panelists would like to add something regarding this question. I can I can see John Josh thinking a bit. <laughs> no, but I, I guess it was just a, that that it is a real problem in some parts of the world. Um, 
I was just uh, doing some work uh, in the West Balkans and there the number one problem that water utilities have in terms of human resources is that people are moving out of the country elsewhere and in, in some of the West Balkans. So, so it's a real problem. Um, and again, it's just how do you, you know, how do you make jobs more attractive to people to stay in their home countries uh, uh or yeah to 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 meet the human resources needs so so but this is a in certain parts of the world it's very much an issue that has to be thought about carefully how to address because it's, that's also about bigger issues other than just water and sanitation as well it, definitely um thank you so much josh as well we have here a question from maddie Regarding also a bit in terms of like languages skills, as the wash is a sector mainly governed by English speaking, uh, some French speakers in this case, for example, in the wash shatter, the sector, find it tough to interact. And how can we bridge this gap in terms of like different languages? You you are muted, Josh. I don't know if you wanted to say something, but. Yeah, it's I mean bridging that gap, it's a it's a it's a good question. Um there is a I would I would argue that there, I mean, and maybe the because there are say subpopulations, I don't know, like subsectors within WASH that are that are dominated by a certain language, actually, because there is a there is a large French humanitarian WASH sector, if you will. Um, because some of the m biggest NGOs that work on WASH are French. Um, and then there's a lot of French speaking countries where there's a lot of WASH work being done. And so I, and just seeing through the jobs lens and the website, the second number, highest number of WASH jobs are, are French. Um, and then you have a Spanish and then you have a Portuguese, um, but it's all based on the countries that they're working in. Um, so, but bridging those, that, those gaps, um, you know, usually if, the heads of the 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 missions and the people on the ground in these countries have to speak the language of those countries. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure about how to bridge that um, that, but I would I would say that it's it is uh, there are different areas uh, that are definitely siloed by language, though. Yeah, definitely. If you also all of you allowed me, I can also share here a bit my experience because I'm a PhD student from Portugal, but I'm doing my my PhD in Denmark and I'm working with a utility, and it's definitely even if, if everything is in English, you really need this bridge also with the Danish language to work with other stakeholders. So it's definitely something that it can be taken care of, uh, in the future. Uh, we have well, here also uh yes. Well, I, to, I just wanted to say one thing, which is um, so the language issue is is um, very, very interesting. And it's not I guess it's not just the um, English and French and other European languages. There's a number of Asian languages also I think that sometimes kind of fall in, uh, get, get left out of the discussion or get parceled off, I guess. Um, uh, and the. But it, it relates to the, the last question, which you may be getting to, um, which I think is how will AI shape uh, water jobs in the future? Actually, this is one of those ways that AI may shape water jobs in the future, because AI language translation has come a very long way. Um, and although I'm hesitant to, to fully recommend it now, it's a uh, um, there, there are elements of that, of the bridging between these, these potentially these different language barriers that, that, um, that it, the AI tools can potentially help to solve because, um, you know, they can, can, can produce things in, in different languages, um, that, uh, in, with much less effort, I guess. Um, but just to come back on that as well, there are, um, the, it, it's very difficult to see at this point exactly how AI is going to shape things. Um, there will be, there are obviously a number of um, analytical data analytics that are gonna be huge. Uh, I think that's already been mentioned. Um, the, um, uh, the water sector in the UK is, is, is swimming in, increasingly swimming in data and crying out for, for jobs in, in uh, skills in, in in data and analytics, um, but that's a in you know it's obviously a, a, a more Western perspective on it. Not all water sectors will be at that level, but 
Um, but yeah, I think I think there's from from a data analysis point of view, there's there's going to be a lot in there and the, and the potential to visualize data, huge amounts of data in a more accessible way um, as part of decision making processes for the future of you know water sector planning. I think that's where it will it could make a very very big difference. Um, but yeah, it's it's still it's still probably difficult to see exactly how how those effects will play out. Thank you so much, Heather. It was really great that you connected the two questions. Uh, I don't know if uh, the other panelists will also like to add something regarding AI and how this will shape the water jobs in the future and what you think about that. I'll just I'll chime in a little bit. I, I Sometimes I worry that I'll be replaced by AI within a few years based on it. some of the things I do with it. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's what I spent like 10 years learning. Um, <laughs> so, but... I, there was a quote that somebody said, I think I saw it on, on Twitter or something, um, and it's not entirely true, but I do think it, it, it is, is that, you know, we won't, a lot of the jobs aren't going to be, you're not going to be replaced by AI, you're going to be replaced by someone who knows how to use AI. Um, and so that's something that uh, I think is I've like already, you know, I use it now in, in, in a lot of the work I do. Um, and so if you know, you know, how to use AI, that already puts you ahead of, of people uh, who, who don't and, and where the future is going. Because it's a reality that it's going to be integrated into, into the work that we do, um, whether we like it or not uh, in the future. So but so being comfortable with it and utilizing it, I think, is, is an important skill to have looking towards the future. Definitely. Thank you so much. I don't know if it's any of you, the panelists, that would like to to say just some last words before you wrap up. I guess not. So uh, thank you so much for this great panel discussion. I think we have really great inputs and, um, and some solutions also, because sometimes it could also be in these webinars that let's say we talk a lot, but then we don't really come up with, with anything. So hopefully we'll have some solutions. Uh, some young water professionals, also good luck for all of you in terms of finding jobs, internships. Uh, I will also ask you, all the panelists, to put in the chat also the way for you to connect in terms of LinkedIn and all the social media. So everyone can be free to connect and, uh, and share also all the information. We will have this webinar, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's recorded and it will be shared in the IWA network. So you can also have um, a check there. In terms of upcoming webinars and events, we have three in April. Uh, the 10th of April, we have one webinar in terms of improving sanitation in South Asia. We have a lecture on the 16th of April regarding micro and nanoplastics in, within environmental technology. And then we have the webinar on the 24th of April about managing disinfection and byproducts for safe water. For events, we have two great conferences. I think in the next, exactly, thank you, Erin. Uh, two great conferences coming up. We have the IWA Leading Edge Conference in Germany in June, and then the World Water Congress in Toronto in Canada. So I hope to see many of you also there. Join the network. It's as we, also, as we talked about in this webinar, is a really great way to get out of your comfort zone. You really need the networking for jobs, to get to know the right people, to share knowledge, to learn a lot from different uh, people and more experienced and young ones as well. So IW also brings professionals into different disciplines that it's important to learn within the broader water sector. So you can use this code for 20% of discount for new membership until the last day of the year. Thank you so much for all the panelists. Thank you so much for the participants. It was great discussion. Uh, it was really, really interesting. And as Neil was saying at one point, we had 160 participants, which I think is really, really great uh, for this kind of webinars. If you want to still have some questions, feel free to, to type it and we'll try to answer them at the end of the webinar and send it to the different panelists. Uh, thank you so much. Connect on LinkedIn and uh, I hope to see you 
around at some webinars or also some events within IWA. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Rest of the day for some of you, maybe. And thank you so much. And good luck for all of you looking for jobs and internships. Thank you so much.